Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining Grand Rounds this morning. Uh, we have a great presentation with a, uh, a real, uh, a very amazing panel of uh, presenters. Um, I will turn that over to Jason Berman to do the introductions, but I will begin by acknowledging that Ottawa is built on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. The peoples of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation have lived on this territory for millennia, and we honor them and this land. Their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. CHEO also honors all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples and their valuable past, present and future contributions to this land. With that, I am gonna hand it over to Jason to introduce our speakers and um, presentation for this morning. Thanks very much, uh, Mona and uh, good morning, everyone. Really delighted to, interview, uh, to introduce our speakers uh, this, this morning. Um, who will be speaking about applications of machine learning to health data. Uh, it's hard to go anywhere these days where uh, you're talking about health and the conversation doesn't move into a discussion of AI and machine learning. As I think many of you know, we have been building our capacity in AI and machine learning at uh, the CHEO Research Institute and are very proud of our growing team. A cornerstone of that team is Dr. Khaled Elaman, who will be leading the presentation this morning. Khaled is a, a Canada Research Chair, Tier 1 in Medical AI at the University of Ottawa and the CHEO Research Institute. He's a professor in the School of Epidemiology and Public Health. He's a senior scientist at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute and director of the Multidisciplinary Electronic Health Information Laboratory, where he conducts research on privacy-enhancing technologies to enable the sharing of health data for secondary purposes, including synthetic data generation and de-identification methods. He brings with him today members of his team, including Dr. Lamin Jawara, Dr. Samir uh, Kababji, um, uh, Dr. William Clement, and Dr. Dan Liu, as well as Dr. Nicholas Mitsakakis uh, from the CRU, who has been working with Khaled and his team. And each of those individuals will have an opportunity to further introduce themselves as they come to their part of the presentation. So thank you very much, Khaled, for uh, presenting this morning and bringing your team. Looking forward to your presentation. Great. Um, th thank you very much. Um, and uh, uh, thanks, everyone, for, for joining us this morning. So um, the, um, uh, the main theme for today will be uh, the uh, describing the work that we've been doing at, at the research lab. Um, and uh, the main topic we've uh, uh, we've been working on is synthetic data generation or generative AI, which you've probably heard a lot about in the media. So we'll talk we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll have uh, uh, six different presentations, one after the other. I'll do the intro, and then each um, one of the, the members of the team will will give uh, a presentation of their project. Um, and um, here they are. Um, so uh, each project will be presented by the lead, although the, the team works together, the, the lead will, will, will be presenting the, the particular topic. So there's a lot of information to cover. I'm hoping that one or two or more than two of the projects will be of interest to you and will provide you with some insights about uh, uh, applications of, of machine learning. Um, and uh, uh, because we're covering so many topics, each one will, will, will be covered uh, briefly, but, but hopefully give you enough information to understand the, the, the problem we're trying to solve and the, the solutions that we've developed up to, up to this point. Um, so um, with that, let me give you the introduction to the main theme of the work that uh, we're doing at the, uh, the Electronic Health Information Research Lab at the, at the Research Institute. Um, so, um, let me start off with this picture. This is Space Opera Theater. This is uh, an image that was generated by, or produced by a generative model. So by, by a uh, machine learning model that was trained on a large bank of images. And this particular image won the uh, Colorado State Fair uh, Fine Arts Competition um, earlier this year. And of course, uh, having a machine generated image win a fine arts competition raises a lot of issues about creativity and copyright, and it upset a few artists as well. But it just goes to show the the quality um, of of uh, machine generated images, and this was generated using prompts. So so um, the 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 uh, uh, artist, so to speak, uh, entered a few prompts in Midjourney and was able to produce this this award winning uh, painting. Uh, you've also seen deep fakes before. These are also generated or produced using generative AI. So these are all images of fake people. These are not real people. 
And again, uh, they were generated by a machine learning model that was trained on a large bank of, of images. Um, and, a, and a recent study uh, with members of the public asked them whether uh, they could tell the difference between real images and, and fake images, and they couldn't tell the difference, and they, they trusted the images of the fake people more than the real people, uh, which, which is a little bit scary. Um, but the point is that uh, generative AI has advanced quite a bit, um, and I'm giving examples here with images, but of course you can generate other types of data. Uh, you can generate voice, you can generate video, but you can also generate uh, structured data, which is what we do. So the basic idea um, here is you take a source data set um, of some sort. It could be a clinical trial. It could be an EMR. It could be a registry. Uh, it could be some real world data. And then you train a machine learning model um, to learn the patterns in this source data set. There are many different types of machine learn learning models that can be trained. Um, and then you generate new data from the trained model. So that's the synthetic data. And uh, on the right-hand side, there is uh, an example of a, of a synthetic clinical trial data set. And uh, the, the generated data looks realistic, same variable, same structure, and have the same statistical properties as the, as the original data. And um, uh, as, as I um, alluded to before, the, the technology to do this has improved quite a bit over the last few years. So the quality of the synthetic data has been steadily improving over time. And the, uh, the important point to make is that um, the, um, uh, you do not need to know how the synthetic data will be used to generate useful synthetic data. So we're at the point where the generated synthetic data is uh, useful across multiple use cases, multiple you know, analytic workloads, so that you do, not know, you do not need to know a priori what type of analysis you're going to do with the data before you generate it. Um, and this is um, the general uh, structure of the... Uh, uh, the synthetic data generation uh, uh, technology or, or the generative models. So you have two components, a generator and an evaluator. The generator is some machine learning model. It could be system machine learning or neural network that takes in the real data and it tries to learn the patterns in the real data and then generates the synthetic data. And then the evaluator uh, compares the synthetic data to the real data uh, using utility and privacy metrics. Utility is, is how good synthetic data is in terms of capturing the patterns in the real data. And then of course, one of the big uh, use cases for synthetic data is privacy, so there's a number of privacy metrics as well. And then the combination of those is sent back to the generator as a score, and that's used to continue training the generator and tune its hyperparameters, and you essentially iterate between the generator and evaluator uh, until you reach some stopping criterion. And at that point, uh, you have synthetic data that has high utility and good privacy characteristics. So this is the basic scheme for most generative models in terms of how they work, at least the ones that are used to um, generate structured structured data. And we've uh, developed uh, such tools and deployed them at the uh, CHEO Research Institute um, uh, earlier this year. So now we have um, a, a set of generative uh, modeling tools that can be uh, applied to create synthetic data sets based on um, data that's coming out of EPIC um, and we're starting to uh, talk and, and work with, with various groups within the RI to uh, apply um, uh, synthetic data generation to, to help address some of their problems. So um, it, it, it took a, a, a couple of years to, to get to this point to build the technology and so on, but now we, we're here and we have, we have something that is uh, working and we're starting to, to uh, uh, apply it a little bit more broadly. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention before we jump into the, the next set of topics is uh, we, we did uh, start um, uh, a new journal, Jamir AI. Jamir is, is one of the top medical informatics um, journals again, by Impact Factor and AI. Jamir AI is, is a sister journal focusing on AI and this started last year. So I'd encourage you if you're working in, in AI or machine learning to submit your, your article star journal. Um, it's an apply, applied journal um, and we're, you know, we're looking for um, model development, model deployment um, uh, type papers, as well as you know, policy uh, and regulatory uh, type papers. Um, and this will become relevant uh, for some of the subsequent presentations as well. Um, so here are the five presentations from, from the, the team that will be covered. Uh, so I'll just uh, describe them very briefly, and then and then I'll let uh, each member of the team go through the project. But I, I wanted to give you an intro roadmap so you can understand um, types of things we've been working on, and they're all related to some way to machine learning and synthetic data generation. So the first project by Samer, uh, he was at, uh, answering the question of whether we can create synthetic clinical trial data sets that look realistic, 
Um, so we did a, a large study with, with um, uh, eight clinical trials and the, the, the main benefit or the main conclusion that's useful for you from this work is we have evidence now, uh, quite a bit of evidence actually for a real world data, but in this case on clinical trial data that that's, uh, uh, synthetic data has good utility and privacy characteristics. So Samar will describe that. The second presentation is looking at bias and bias data sets. So Lamin looked at uh, whether uh, synthetic data generation or generative AI methods can be used to uh, de-bias uh, bias data sets. And, and you know, bias would, could be gender, could be racial, could be socioeconomic and so on. Um, and so uh, he developed uh, methods to, to uh, compensate for bias data sets and, and uh, uh, reduce the extent of bias in those uh, data sets. Um, the third presentation by William, uh, in, in this one, um, uh, we developed a set of uh, consolidated guidelines for reporting machine learning studies. So one of the big problems we started seeing, especially with the journal, was that the uh, quality of reporting of machine learning modeling studies was uh, very heterogeneous. Um, and that made it difficult to, to uh, understand what was going on, also difficult for reviewers to review. So we've developed consolidated guide, guidelines across the literature, based on what's been published already in the literature. And so William will talk about that. Um, and then the fourth presentation by Nicholas uh, is on sample size estimation for uh, machine learning studies. So uh, there's actually no real uh, set of guidelines for what the sample size uh, sizes, suitable sample sizes should be for machine learning studies. Um, to help design studies. And this is a particular problem for us in, in, in PEDS because data sets tend to be small. So we really need to know whether the data sets are, are sufficient for, for using certain machine learning models, uh, modeling techniques, and, and what, what the uh, trade-offs would be. So, so uh, Nicholas has been working on that and developing such guidelines. And then um, the fifth presentation by Dan um, is, uh, well, if, if the, the, the data sets are small for the machine learning models, then you can augment them um, by using synthetic data generation. Um, so you can simulate additional uh, records that, that look very realistic. So then you, you also run into the big data problem where um, if you have very large data sets, it's actually very harder to, to train machine learning models because of computation limitations. So it's done looking at um, how to scale uh, machine learning uh, methods to larger data sets. So the five presentation will be presentations will be given in this order, um, and uh, for each one of them, you know, we try to present uh, the the value that that uh, you can get out of this uh, for, uh, to to support your research work um, and your analytic uh, work um, on the on the right hand side side column. And uh, uh, last uh, point is just want to acknowledge all of our funders um, over the years funded different parts of this project. We also have a lot of collaborators internally within Chio and externally at the TOH um, and, and outside the hospital. So we couldn't list them all because there are actually too many to, to, to list and we were afraid we forget someone. So just want to acknowledge a lot of collaborators, appreciate working with them and also um, want to thank our funders. And with that, I will pass it on to Samer to present uh, the first project. Okay, thank you very much, Khalid. Um... In our project, we are trying to answer the question, can we use synthetic data as a proxy for real data in clinical trials? My name is Samir el -Kababji. I'm a postdoc at Chio Research Institute. I have, a, um, uh, I'm, I have an engineering background. I have experience in, uh, in, in various domains, but my focus is on generative models. Now, in the first place, why are we interested in synthetic data? You collect data for your clinical trial. You spend time and effort for that. And then you conduct your primary analysis and possibly secondary analysis. You publish your results and you share it with your colleagues. But then, you still have this valuable information, valuable data, which you have collected about your patients. And um, a researcher wants to use that. You wanna share this data with that researcher in the country or even across the continent, but you care about the privacy of your patients. So there's always privacy concerns when you want to share data. So one of the solutions would be to use synthetic data because in synthetic data, there's no one-to-one -one mapping between a real person and a data point. The big question is, is synthetic data good enough 
to carry out, to reuse the data, carry out further analysis and reach sound conclusions. And this is the core of our project. We have obtained data for eight breast cancer clinical trials. And we would like to thank everyone who participated in making that available for us. For every single data set, for every single real data set, we have used three generative models to create the synthetic data. Then we took the real data and the synthetic data and we applied exactly the same analysis on both of them as per the published papers of the eight clinical trials. We then compared the analysis with three metrics as we're gonna see in a minute. We have also tested the synthetic data for the privacy. And uh, there are two privacy risks which we have tested and we're gonna talk about that in the few slides. Here are the eight data sets which we have worked on. As you see, the top five data sets, they are smaller size in terms of the number of patients. And uh, you see all of them, they have different numbers of variables we dealt with. We used three generative models to create the synthetic data. All of them, they are machine learning techniques and uh, they are widely used. The first is sequential tree-based synthesizers and the remaining two, conditional generative adversarial networks and tabular variation autoencoders, they both include neural network architecture. We have also tested the privacy and the privacy, two aspects, membership disclosure and attribution disclosure. Now to explain the concept of membership disclosure, consider a clinical trial with uh, uh, HIV patients. Then, and that data set was used to train a generative model. Consider a target patient. If you know that target patient was part of the training data set that's used to train the generative model, then you definitely know if you know that he was a member or she was a member in that training data set, then you definitely know that he was an HIV patient. And the risk associated with that is called membership disclosure risk. Now, in case of attribution disclosure, if you know two or three attributes, easy to know attributes about the patient, like the age, the weight, then by accessing synthetic data, you may know something more about the patient. You will gain more knowledge about the patient, like the prescription. And the risk associated with that is called attribution disclosure. The metrics which we use to evaluate utility and privacy. For utility, we use three metrics, estimate agreement. So we have the real data and the synthetic data. If there is an agreement in terms of the estimate, then we check it, yes, right? match, it's a, it's a perfect match if there's a, 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 an agreement in the decision. Like say if one of the clinical trials involves test of hypothesis and both when we carry out that analysis on the real data set and the synthetic data set, they resulted in the rejection of the hypothesis, then we have a complete decision agreement. So we take match and then the confidence on interval overlap. For privacy, we have compared that with a certain of threshold, which is uh, available in the literature. Now, here is an example of, um, here is a sample of one of the data sets uh, of the results, like the ILIA data set, it has 218 number of patients. And you see the sequential model, which we have used, outperformed the remaining two models, which is the GAN and the variation autoencoders with, 0.99 confidence interval overlap between the real and the, and the synthetic. Now, in terms of the uh, of the risks of the privacy risks, I mean all the models reported very low privacy risks in terms of both membership disclosure risk and attribution risk. 
Uh, to summarize, uh, we use the three synthesizers. And as you see, like in the sequential model, there was an estimate agreement in eight out of eight. So eight out of eight matches between real and synthetic data. And in terms of decision agreement, seven out of seven, because one of them just, just was, uh, one of the clinical trials has only descriptive analysis. And uh, as you see, the confidence interval overlap for sequential, when using sequential uh, synthesizer, it reported more than 0 0.75 overlap. And all the membership disclosure attribute disclosure, it was extremely low. And um, only one of them reported high. And this goes by definition, because in this specific case, the training data set was half the population. And it, it goes by definition that um, that risk is carried forward. To summarize, now, a sequential synthesizers provide researchers with quality synthetic data that can be used and disclosed for secondary analysis, so you can use it. Synthetic data involve low privacy risks that allow for data sharing across the country jurisdiction. And thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Samer. And now Lamin will present the project on uh, bias mitigation. Thank you. Okay, so the next application that we explored is to look at how synthetic data could be used to mitigate data bias. My name is Lamin. I am a postdoc at the lab. So data bias is often a convoluted term, and it could mean different things to different people. Um, formally, the way we define data bias is to say that a, a data set is biased if the variables in the sample cohort, if they have a different distribution than the variables in the original population. In, in this hypothetical example that we have shown, um, the population, we have a population involving 10 observations, so five men and five female. If we take a sample out of that and obtain a sample cohort of um, uh, five male and one female, so this will be an example of a sampling selection bias. And this is exactly the kind of bias that we want to look at and mitigate. Um, now, there, there are, um, Side biases could occur at different stages of your study cycle, um, all the way from uh, data collection to analysis. And, and this could be due to difficulty in recruiting from certain groups, perhaps due to cost access or non-response. Um, it, it, this bias can also result if the data generating process that you are using is inherently biased, or if certain groups are in, excluded from the analysis data set, right? Um, it is important to point out that this is different from missingness bias because for me, uh, in that with sampling selection bias, the entire observation is missing, whilst for missingness bias, you have an observation missing for a particular variable. Um, over the years, various examples of data bias have made headlines over the, uh, over the news. Um, one example that might be of interest is with treatment referral systems. Um, in VA hospitals, which have been shown to be biased against ethnic minorities. Um, this was from, a, this from a, it was from a study that was commissioned by the VA hospitals in 2019. Um, there are various other examples in employment and in predicting repeated offenders in prison systems. Uh, so these biases, we can classify them into three broad categories. Um, the first one is marginal bias. That is essentially when observations from a particular group are omitted from the sample data set solely based on their membership to that biasing variable. For example, if a data set is biased with respect to gender and we exclude females solely based on gender and not based on any other variable within the data. So this will be an example of a marginal bias. Um, we also consider two conditional cases. So the first conditional case is when we condition on another covariate, which is weakly associated with the biasing variable. For example, if the biasing variable is, gen is gender and we exclude females um, who do not have college education, for example. We know that college education is not necessarily associated with gender, um, at least in North America. So this would be an example of a conditional type 1 bias. So conditional type 2 bias is a little bit more severe. That is when we condition on a variable which is strongly associated with the biasing variable. For example, if we exclude female participants who are of low income, right? Unfortunately, we know that income levels are strongly associated with gender. So this would be an example of a conditional type 2 bias. 
Um, so over the years, various approaches have been proposed for mitigating bias. Some ex examples include oversampling, your observations under sampling, and various propensity score approaches. In this work, we propose a new bias mitigating approach called synthetic minor augmentation. So essentially what it involves is we start with a bias data, and then we generate a synthetic version of a bias sample. From that synthetic version, we sample the underrepresented groups and augment them with the bias data. So we end up with a new data, which is balanced, and it is a combination of the bias sample and then the sample synthetic version of the under, underrepresented groups. Um, so in order to compare the approach that we propose to previously proposed methods, we use this training and evaluation scheme. So essentially, we start with the same original cohort, which we split into a training and a test set. When we evaluate the training set on the test set using a standard model, um, this is what we considered as our ground truth or the gold standard. The next thing that we did is to use the training cohort and then induce bias. Um, consequently, we applied the different bias mitigating approaches, including SMA, which is the synthetic minor augmentation method that we propose. Um, for each bias mitigated data, we evaluated on the same test set. This allows us to do a fair comparison. We considered several metrics, so we estimated uh, area under the curve to show the model's predictive like performance. We also estimated auth basis on standard errors to show how parameter estimation will perform. And then we also estimated several fairness metrics to show how similar or dissimilar the groups are within the bias variable. Um, so we, we did this through various simulations and case studies, but I will show you results for one of our case studies. Um, we looked at, at the colon cancer trial data, um, which involved about 1,500 observations, 10 variables. The outcome of interest was death. Um, the main bias in variable was burial obstruction. And then we considered two conditioning variables, so gender, which was weakly associated with burial obstruction, and BMI, which was strongly associated. Um, and for, for each of these conditions, we will look at the results. So we, we look at the effect estimates um, of the Bayesian variable. Um, so we, you, you will see that as the proportion of, mis as the proportion of bias uh, goes from low to high, um, we are able to consistently mitigate for bias, at least from low up to 50% of bias. Um, the black bar basically represents the bias estimates you will see that as the bias in proportion increases, it further deviates away from the gold standard, which is the, which is the red line. Um, and then you also have increased standard errors. Our approach is able to mitigate for this from low to medium bias, and we also improve on the efficiency of the estimate. Um, similarly, in terms of the model's predictive like performance, you will see that the AUC estimate, we are able to at least match or do better than the bias estimate uh, con con consistently from low to medium bias. In extreme cases, we do, uh, there is no conclusive result, and we do not necessarily correct for it in extreme cases. And this is true even with comparison to all of the other approaches. So we could make several conclusions from this. We know that the model parameter estimates are significantly affected by bias. Um, AUC is affected to a lesser extent. Um, the synthetic minor augmentation approach that we propose, it works well, both in absolute and like relative terms compared to all of the other approaches. And this holds true for uh, low to medium bias. Um, in more extreme cases of bias, we do not necessarily mitigate for it. There is no, no, no definitive conclusions could be made from this. And overall, the synthetic minor augmentation approach that we propose, it, it leads to the best fairness amongst the biasing groups. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lamin. Um, and then the next presentation will be by uh, William. And in this one, he'll be talking about um, reporting guidelines for machine learning modeling studies um, and the consolidation uh, consolidated guidelines for that. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present this work to you. As you probably um, seen, um, uh, evaluation is a critical step from um, as part of the synthetic data generation, because it's crucial to ensure that the data that's generated is part of 
the realistic uh, pool that it's generated from. Uh, and this applies similarly to research work and the ability to understand the various steps involved in work uh, calls for um, better reporting standards so that we can understand and assess and replicate the work that is being published. So what we tried to do here, we tried to somehow consolidate all the work that is out there with regards to reporting on machine learning methods use in prognostic and diagnostic tools. So uh, we looked at the literature and somehow, I'll explain a little later, we ended up with 25 published reporting guidelines um, that generated 36 reporting items. And now we noticed that these did always covered different aspects of the analytic life cycle, and none of them actually covered um, the list of 36 items comprehensively. So uh, before I can start, I'll just um, define the scope of this work. The scope was limited to standardized data mining uh, analytic workflow. We reported uh, the uh, assessment in five categories that dealt with the uh, study details, description of the, of the data, the methods being used to process the data, the evaluation of the model, and interpretation of the model. We also limited the scope of the studies that were considered to in silico studies that is computationally simulated on a computer, that is, and to uh, machine learning models that are running in the shadow mode, as opposed to machine learning models that cause an intervention, which would call for an assessment similar to a clinical trial. So we avoided those. Um, so we basically relied on an, a traditional query against PubMed database, and we also curated ex um, expert-based opinions through a bunch of articles. Long story short, we ended up with the 25 items after removing everything that was not technically relevant or contributing. Then um, the principles we applied in reviewing these um, literature articles, we looked at reinforcing good practice as we know it today. Now, obviously this may change in the future and it will require constant updating. We also focused on reporting tasks as opposed to making recommendations of how, what to do when you're solving a problem of this kind because people can come up with their own ideas. Um, we also did not add any new items of our own. We just simply consolidated what's already there. And we excluded certain categories of literature that had to do with implementation, reproducibility, or things that depended on the type of data being processed. For example, images require different strategies um, or the collection of the data itself. We also excluded any theoretical results reporting. Right. So. We went to assess the coverage of these guidelines across the different categories. And for the five categories, it was very clear that the number of articles or the percentage of articles that, that covered certain uh, methodolo uh, methodology of a given reporting cycle was clearly behind than the rest of the other categories. Most of the work concentrated on the data description, explainability uh, or interpretation, study details, evaluation, but uh, methodology was clearly left behind. Then we repeated the same idea at the level of the item. So here we have the 36 items that we looked at. Interestingly enough, for example, the, uh, the model evaluation did not particularly score very high. However, it is clear from this bar plot that when, when the, a given guideline reported in that category, it reported on it um, comprehensively or close enough. So if you look at the bottom here, the three items were reported in 23 articles out of the 25 articles that we reported. And then some of its items were on the low side, less than nine articles per item. So basically this says that if this category was reported, it was reported well. And if it wasn't reported, then it was really low and on the thin part. Um, to Certain conclusions we can draw from this is that first we have a checklist that can be used by authors and reviewers to assess the, the quality of research work done using machine learning methods in prognostic or diagnostic tools. This will help improve the understandability and reproducibility of the research studies. Um, now, uh, we limited the scope of this to in silico and shadow mode uh, machine learning models. And this highlights the experience and the current state of research that is concentrated at that level. 
the next level that should technically um, be um, a bit more active is the evaluation of the deployment in clinical studies and how we can actually uh, make use of them. Um, another thing we also will, will try to do is to update and monitor and evaluate all of these guidelines with respect to the AI and, and machine learning literature so that they remain um, relevant and uh, up to date. And thank you very much for listening to me. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, William. Um, so then the next project is by Nicholas and he'll be looking, uh, he was looking at uh, sample size estimation for machine learning modeling studies, which is a huge problem um that really hasn't been looked at um so nicholas yes good morning everyone my name is nicholas mitsakakis i will be um uh, i am a senior biostatistician in the clinical research unit and also an associate science science scientist in research institute i'll be talking on sample size determination when using machine learning in clinical research Sample size determination is required for designing efficient clinical studies, and this is especially important for pediatric studies after having small data sets. It is also essential for grant applications and publications. So when we, uh, uh, when, uh, uh, we, we, have we, we have studies where traditional statistical methods are employed, then we can use well-established sample size calculation methods. But that this is not the case when machine learning modeling methods are to be used in the study, under, uh, the study under design. <clears throat> so the common rationale, uh, the common practice is uh, the use of a simplistic rule of 10 events per predictor or just ignoring the problem, which are both uh, no, no, um, not acceptable. We, can also, we, we often also see the use of recently developed uh, methods for calculating sample size for, uh, for risk prediction models, but these methods rely on theory and empirical results that are applicable to specific statistical modeling methods, such as logistic regression, and they're not directly applicable to arbitrary machine learning methods such as SVM or, or like random forest. So, the, so, so therefore, they, their use is not justifiable and not recommended. We conducted a thorough literature uh, review uh, in order to identify studies discussing approaches for uh, sample size calculations for machine learning models. We found a very small number of studies uh, and, uh, and they, they are actually suffer by various types of limitations including limited uh, types of machine learning models examined, insufficient tuning of machine learning models, unrealistic distributions used for the simulations, small range of sample sizes examined, and, and also no precise mechanism for determining adequate sample size. So the objective of our study is to use a large scale simulation uh, design for constructing a mechanism for determining adequate sample size for studies employing machine learning models for binary classification. So we, we use a previously published simulated benchmark data sets as population data. And important to mention here that these, that these benchmark data sets were intended to increase performance variability across different machine learning, machine learning, machine learning um, the models, and we thought they were uh, appropriate for our study. So each one of those data sets have uh, 14 to 100 variables with different kinds of uh, distributions from continuous to categorical variables. Uh, the, the, we, the, they also include the dichotomous outcome and a very large um, now number of observations. Subsequently, we sampled the various size uh, subsets from these population sets. And then we use the population and the sample sets in order to train different models coming from four different machine learning, machine learning um, uh, the modeling methods. We uh, tuned and assessed uh, those models using nested cross-validation. And we measured their performance using the area under the curve and Briar index. We calculated the relative performance as the ratio of the performance of the sample over the performance of the population. 
And then we defined as an adequate performance equal to 90% of, of the performance on the population set. And uh, this diagram illustrates the pipeline process that I just described. And you can see on the top uh, left corner, the four different machine learning methods that we used for this analysis. So now moving on to the results, this is a snapshot based on 10 population data sets, that each one of them having 14 categorical variables. And you can see the relative performance of the trained models from a specific machine le learning method against the size of the sample. So here, the size of the sample is measured by the number of events per variable, which is equal to the size of the smallest class over the number of the variables in the model. The red and green lines indicate the population and the adequate performance respectively. <laughs> We can also move to a model agnostic approach where the best performing model is selected for each sample. And here we also have a blue a smoothing curve that displays the average relationship between the size of the sample and the relative per performance of the best performing model for that sample. So you can also see the point where the blue curve intersects the green line and that point corresponds to the sample size that on average is required for, uh, for achieving adequate per performance. So the conclusions for the, the analysis so far, based on the results so far, on average, about 45 events per variable, which in our case corresponds to, to 1,260 observations. Again, we, we, we only included 14 variables here is needed for achieving adequate per performance. So it's very important to point out here that um, we could use synthetic data methods uh, in order to augment small data sets for, for basically by helping us to reach this sample size target. So next steps will include uh, the completion of the simulation and compilation of the, re the results. So this means more data sets uh, uh, like like larger number of variables in the data sets uh, and, and also including categorical variables. And finally, we will use the complete set of results to build a calculator for determining adequate sample size given the study characteristics. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you so much, Nicholas. And then uh, the fifth presentation by Dan, who uh, uh, whose work builds on these uh, types of results to look at scaling of machine learning models. Well, thank you, Clad. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Liu. I'm the postdoc fellow at the Chiu Research Institute and uh, um, University of Ottawa. <clears throat> So my colleague, uh, Nicholas, just presented his work on determining uh, the minimal sample size to achieve good performance for machine learning models. So uh, that means on some occasions, we need to augment the data to effectively use machine learning. However, if we increase the sample size tremendously, it can cause problems as well. Uh, and this is the focus of my work uh, to address the challenge of scaling machine learning to handle large data sets. And this is a still work in progress. So uh, typically, uh, machine learning algorithms require a large data sets for model training. But due to the limited memory on a machine- Hey, I'm listening to something, so I can't hear her talk. Um, sorry, so can you hear? I, I can hear you, Dan. Go ahead, Dan, sorry for that interruption. Okay. Um, yeah, so, but due to the limited memory on a machine, uh, processing large data sets can lead to failures or crashes. Moreover, uh, the existing statistical machine learning techniques are inadequate to handle such high volumes of data on a single machine. And this problem becomes more severe in some applications uh, where many models need to be trained, such as uh, sequential synthetic data generation. So our project aims to solve this problem, and we are exploring using a local learning approach to partition the large data sets and make the computations distributed across multiple machines. 
and we develop a methodology to address this problem, which involves three steps. First, we propose two partitioning methods to split the large data sets. And the first method is random partition, uh, which divides the large data set randomly into K groups. And the number of partitions is determined by the number of available machines. The second method is a clustering approach, which divides the data set into K subsets based on the clustering algorithm. And the main advantage of uh, our partitioning method is the ability to distribute the computations across multiple machines. For example, if we have uh, five partitions, then each partition can be assigned to a separate machine for computation, which is different from the traditional way to work with the entire data set on a single machine. After partitioning the data, uh, we are using a boosted tree algorithm to construct the binary uh, classification model in each partition. And the model is optimized uh, with hyperparameter tuning. Moreover, uh, we also plan to explore other machine learning algorithms, such as random forest and neural network in the proposed approaches. And the last step is prediction. So given the testing data, we want to predict the cluster labels. And to achieve this, we employ the framework of local learning, which predicts that known testing objects based on the local training data. So in our proposed approaches, we use it to predict the cluster labels using the local trained models. So once obtained the prediction results, we have uh, various strategies to combine all of them that are made from the multiple machines or alternatively uh, choosing the optimal partition for prediction. So overall, our hypothesis is that um, if there are local patterns, uh, say M patterns in a large data set, our proposed method will be able to identify those patterns and produce a matching K number of partitions. Then the K uh, local models can be trained in a cluster or serially, and we will obtain the same accuracy as the model with the full data set. And to evaluate the effectiveness of our proposed methods, uh, we apply them to two real data sets. The first data set is COVID data set. It contains over uh, 1 million health records of the COVID-19 patients in Canada, and we are interested in feeding models that predict the mortality caused by COVID. We computed the AUC, uh, the area under the curve, which is measure of prediction accuracy for classification models. And then we compare the proposed methods with the baseline method, uh, the ground truth without any partitioning. So our results show that for the COVID data, um, the proposed methods produce the EUCs that are comparable to those of the baseline method. Moreover, the performance of the random partition is shown to be more stable across different K values compared with the clustering methods. And this graph uh, shows the AUC results for the CCHS dataset, uh, the Canadian Community Health Survey data. And uh, this data is a put version across uh, multiple years with over 900,000 um, cardiovascular health records of the Canadians. Our goal for this data set uh, is to predict the ideal state of the cardiovascular health using relevant variables from the data set. Again, uh, the performance of the random partition is uh, consistently stable and very similar to the baseline method in terms of AUC. However, in comparison, uh, the clustering method shows a uh, good performance with small k, but deteriorates as the k increases. So based on these results, uh, there's no, lo uh, there's no uh, strong local patterns detected, and this results do uh, preliminary, and we plan to test out more data sets to see if the finding is generalizable. But at this point, um, both data applications show that the random partition is a good method to use. It's also very easy to implement and requires less computational time. So uh, a summary of the work, um, given the challenges of processing a large scale data sets nowadays, it's necessary to develop advanced techniques to tackle this problem. And we propose two approaches, uh, which scale a large data set into smaller subsets for modeling. Uh, and our ap data applications show that uh, the random partition particularly performs quite well uh, with less running time. And the results we have for now are preliminary. 
So in the next step, uh, we will apply our methods to other machine learning algorithms and additional data sets to ensure the consistency of the results. Um, yeah, that's, that's the end of my presentation. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. So thanks very much, uh, Khaled and team. Uh, lots of information, lots of data, and broken down into um, uh, really easily digestible chunks. Um, there may be um, a number of questions as people um, you know, assimilate that data and think of how they want to apply some of those approaches in their own work. And um, I think uh, it's clear we're very fortunate to have all of this expertise in-house at BRI. So questions, and you can direct them either to Khaled or to the member of his team who focused on that particular area. Well, while we're waiting for questions, maybe um, I'll start, and this is more sort of a, uh, a practical question. If I'm working with a particular patient data set, and, and maybe this question goes more to um, uh, Nicholas for uh, in his presentation, and are looking at opportunities to try to augment that sample size with uh, synthetic data to achieve uh, a sample size in which I can do the analysis that I need, what's the approach that I would that I would take. Am I able to reach out to a member of of your team? And at what point in the process would I want to engage someone? Well, I think uh, the approach would be first of all to to uh, use our, our final product, which is not ready yet, to understand what would be the target sample size that would be appropriate for the analysis that is planned that is being that is planned. And after you determine the sample size needed, then you can um, we will I mean call it in this team and uh, we we will use some of the data augmentation methods to uh, apply to the existing data set in order to reach the target. Thanks, Nicholas. And the process for that would we go through the the CRU through a consult form directed towards you, or is there a different mechanism once you have that tool fully developed? I think uh, Khaled would be the go-to person uh, for that. And he would yeah, I mean, we, we, we haven't figured that out yet, to be honest, but if you can just contact me and we'll, we'll, we'll work through it. We haven't defined a full process yet, um, but if you can contact me and then we can, we can work on setting something up. We Thanks. have the tools running uh, to do the augmentation at the RI. Um, so, um, so you know, we're ready to do it. It's, it's just um, uh, figuring out the process would be the next step. Thanks, Khaled. So uh, Walid uh, Al-Krashi has a question in the chat. Thanks, Khaled and team for the intriguing work. There are established concerns about using uh, AI machine learning in clinical prediction models, especially in clinical problems where the signal to noise ratio is low. Do you think the sample size simulation exercise is going to be generalizable? Um, the, the numbers we are uh, getting for, for, for the sample size are, um, consistent with anecdotal evidence that has existed in the literature in the past. So um, the the improvements that Nicholas made, I think, will result in more precise um, results are more generalizable, generalizable results, but they're still quite high. Like the sample sizes needed for applying machine learning are high and higher than what we typically see in clinical studies. It doesn't mean that they're wrong. It just means that they're so optimal in the sense that the, the uh, uh, accuracy of the models would be less than what they could be if a larger set was available. Um, but um, I, I think that the, the the sample size est estimations that are coming out are um, are reasonable. I mean, I think they're defensible. And the fact that uh, the benchmark data set that, that was used also, I think, helps with generalizability because the way these benchmarks were created were intended to make them applicable across multiple uh, machine learning algorithms. Thanks. Other questions, just looking in the chat and across the room. Um, uh, I have uh, another question, and this was touched on um, a bit in the presentations, but um, uh, maybe you can expand upon this a bit, Khaled, the idea of um, where maybe the opportunities, advantages in using synthetic data when we think about privacy concerns and sharing of uh, personal health information. So the, the, the evidence we have, we've done quite a lot of case studies with real-world data and then the results from some of our clinical trial data. 
um the, the the evidence is consistent that the, the the methods we use like sequential synthesis works really well in terms of producing high quality data sets and also in providing uh good privacy protection the privacy results are are um, you know quite compelling like the, the privacy risks are quite low they're never zero but but they're quite low so it's a good approach to enable data sharing it gives you high quality data and it also uh, provides uh, uh, acceptable pr privacy protection um so the evidence is, is is there it's accumulating it's it's I think relatively strong um the type of synthetic data method you use matters uh, of course um so so the synthetic data generation methods that we evaluated we always land on sequential synthesis as being quite a competitive approach which is the main approach we use here at Chio um so we have good good evidence to support using synthetic data for data sharing as a, as a tool to enable data sharing. Thanks, Khaled. Uh, Dana put a question, and Dana, you may have to expand upon this because you say a question about augmenting underrepresented data in the chat. Is this a concern that you have, or it's a it's it's a question slash a philosophical comment maybe that I've heard differing opinions about increasing the represent uh, you know the amount of underrepresented data so for example there was allusions to if if gender is underrepresented but i guess maybe a caution or a question about you know let's say um as an example indigenous populations are frequently underrepresented in clinical trials and data and if you had just a few participants I mean, I just, I guess I worry that people will say, hey, we can just augment this using synthetic data. All you're going to do is reproduce a couple of people who still may not be representative of the target um, population that your your data set is skewed against. I think that's a valid uh, concern. Uh, the main use case we see right now is to do a sensitivity analysis. So if you have a data set that you believe may be biased, then you can... Um, use um, the bias mitigating approach and evaluate the results uh, with this bias mitigating approach to see if the, the results are, are the same uh, or different uh, from the data that was actually collected. If they're different, then you have evidence that there's bias. And if they're not different, then you have evidence that there may not really be uh, much bias in the, in the data set. Um, and then the other point I'll make is, is it, it's generally, it will generally have to be more than a few individuals, uh, in this case, indigenous uh, people in the data set uh, to build a model. So you still need some data um, in order to to be able to augment it. If you have very little data, if you only have a handful, then you, there's really not much you can do. Um, now, whether that um, small handful will give you a very different answer than everything else, um, that that that's a fair concern. Um, the assumptions we made in the simulations was that the 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 um, we made some assumptions in simulation, you know, with the um, uh, marginal and, and conditional conditional bias, um, which we think are are reasonable and that are consistent with previous evaluations of bias. Um, but it, it's a valid concern for sure. I think for now, I'd just argue for using it for sensitivity analysis, uh, if, you know, before actually using it to draw to draw final conclusions. Thanks, uh, thanks, Dana and Khaled, and and I think that builds on Navjot's question as well, which was what question, uh, uh, is, uh, what method was used to evaluate diversity in the synthetic data set. So I think you sort of touched on that. I don't know if there's anything further you wanna you wanna add based on the response that you gave to the last question. Um, the diversity. Well, we simulated bias, so we had a data set that we we took as the ground truth, and then we simulated different types of bias into it so we induced lack of diversity uh in a controlled way so so we can um we can evaluate the impact of different levels of lack of diversity uh and different levels of complexity also of, of uh, lack of diversity um so these this this was you know, done through the the uh, method we induced bias into into the data set during the simulation great Thanks very much. We're we're right at nine thirty. So please uh, join me in uh, congratulating and thanking Khaled and his team for really an outstanding presentation, making complex topics of AI and machine learning really uh, accessible. And uh, you know, as you've heard, this is uh, a resource that we have available to help you with your research. So please, um, Khaled. You know, I, I hope there won't be a deluge. Be careful what you wish for, but. Um, 
Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, many of you will think about opportunities to uh, incorporate AI and machine learning in your work and reach out to Khaled and his team um, for their input. So thanks very much, everyone. The evaluation has been form has been linked in the chat and have a great day. Thank you.